You know, back when Dark Souls was first released, I had essentially zero interest in it. I'd seen my other half playing Demon Souls and reacted with the kind of ambivalence that you would expect of someone who plays the Bethesda Fallout games on noob difficulty because Shadow Warrior 2 had the right idea, okay? Stop judging me. Anyway, the point is that I was barely interested in Dark Souls at all until I wandered into game one day and saw a copy of the game with the soundtrack and art book for 35 quid on the PS3. I mean, come on. Can you blame me? What a steal, my innocent little first year university student mind thought. A habit that I have never grown out of even after all this time is the crippling urge to purchase things that I'm not even sure I will like because they look cool or they come with some neat free stuff. So rather predictably, I bought it, played it, died a lot, threw a controller across the room. You know, normal stuff. The first trophies that I acquired show the story of my struggle with Dark Souls, the quote unquote hardest game ever, and a benchmark for comparison with other games. The first trophy for lighting a bonfire was relatively easy, I can't expect to have much gaming clout if I can't even manage that, but it wasn't until almost exactly a year later that I managed to achieve the trophy for defeating the Bell Gargoyles. I'm not going to cast smoke and mirrors about, I was bad at the game and I raged like a toddler, until the realisation that tanking everything was just a god awful strategy actually hit me. So off I went, trying new weapons, testing builds, finding my feet, and in the span of a week or so, that saw my poor partner subjected to many, many very grumpy texts, I finally completed the game. So, to transition from rage quitting at the first sign of strife, to rampaging through the first hour of Sekiro in about five minutes flat, I don't think that's bad going for a self-professed noob. If anyone is familiar with my Twitter antics, you'll know that I have a tendency to bitch when I'm struggling with a game, not because I think anyone much cares, but more because voicing things aloud often helps me work through my struggles. And bugger me if it doesn't work well half the time, not long after whining about the game's canonically-ish kind of third boss, I managed to beat him. Shortly after a brief Twitter rampage about the game's final boss and following a few days break from the game, I returned with renewed vigour and defeated the guy in one last determined try. It ended with shaking hands and a thumping heart, so it reminded me of precisely why I adore FromSoft games in the first place. There's a school of thought surrounding these games that I'm not entirely averse to that runs on the supposition that the Soulsborne series is tedious and requires inordinate amounts of skill to complete, that the games are unfair, brutal and punishing, that they rely too much on trial and error. And for a while when I first started playing, I would have wholeheartedly agreed. It's only after years of refining my skills, exploring options and testing out weapons I've never previously used, I'm very much a halberd or a bastard sword kind of player, that I would be inclined to disagree. Trial and error gameplay is a given in most games, but the facetious and often derisive manner in which it is ascribed to the Souls games is one that is somewhat unwarranted. So let's quickly discuss the nature of trial and error gameplay along with some notable reasonably famous examples. In essence, most games feature some degree of trial and error, that mortar you couldn't possibly have seen coming, an attack you're unfamiliar with, a trap that you didn't have the necessary skills to notice. This is nothing new and almost to be expected. Where it reaches a point of pissing people off is usually the point at which the gameplay itself is no longer a matter of skill, where getting good, as it were, is either not an option or simply not possible, but rather a combination of just doing the same thing over and over again and hoping that with a little luck you'll succeed and proceed. Early examples of this, combined with the sheer unyielding nature of older control schemes, are the 90s Tomb Raider games, and extremely egregiously, the early Clock Tower games. Newer games are no stranger to trial and error, though the advent of tighter controls and the internet has made it much easier to combat the inevitable frustration. Games like Limbo and Inside are entirely built around this principle, and there are several instances where trial and error is utilised deliberately in the Persona series, to the extent that in Persona 4, one wrong choice in a multi-part series of dialogue options can and will result in a bad ending. But perhaps the most infuriating instance is in the original Forbidden Siren, or Siren in North America. If you've not played the game, then I won't go into detail, but if you have... Do you remember the piggy bank and frozen blanket thing? 
However, perhaps the easiest and most forgivable example of trial and error gameplay lies at the very core of adventure games, especially point-and-click games. Many adventure games are notorious for their extremely specific routes of progression, and more so for the tremendous tests of logic that they employ. Oftentimes prompting an explosive, well how the hell was I supposed to figure that out? Trial and error, as discussed in its TV Tropes article, is oftentimes discussed in terms of fake or artificial difficulty, which is to say, something that the game is deliberately designed to do, to either artificially inflate its difficulty way beyond the player's skill set, or produce something the player could not possibly have anticipated purely in order to kill them, force a reload and make them do it again, this time knowing what to do next. In its better instances, such as in Super Meat Boy or games like Hollow Knight, Wings of V and similar games, the learning process and generally compact and or impeccably designed levels takes away from the frustration of repetition, as it feels as though progress is being made with each step that one takes until the next checkpoint is reached. Its intent is to culminate in a feeling of pronounced success and accomplishment. In its worst instances, however, you end up with games like Outlast 2. I've already talked at length about this game, but I would also like to point you towards two other videos, one by Shammy and another by Purposeless Rabbit Holes, who both do a far more thorough job than I of explaining why this game is a pain in the arse. There'll be links in the description. I'm bringing all this up because trial and error was a phrase thrown around when the Souls games started to become fairly popular. I won't deny that the phrase, well, how the hell was I supposed to avoid that, was something I bellowed more than once, but at least I know better now. There are only a small handful of instances within Dark Souls that I would put forward as genuinely bad design, and as a result, actual instances of trial and error gameplay, that being the Bed of Chaos and the Anor Londo Archers. Aside from these two infamous examples, the game does a relatively good job of building up its tougher, more intense enemies by giving the player plenty of opportunity to learn and improve through its early game areas. The tried and true method of seeing just how much better you've become is to return to early game areas that you struggled with and see how quickly you breeze through them. It makes it far easier to appreciate the fact that the game isn't a brick wall, you're just a wad of cotton at the start and a mummified corpse at the end. But we're not here to discuss the Souls games. I suspect the reason why Sekiro has been pinpointed by so many individuals and professional outlets for its heightened difficulty is because, comparable to Bloodborne and especially the early Souls games, it is considerably faster, and by extension of its lack of RPG elements, far less forgiving. In From Software's previous games, if you were struggling, there were always other options available to you. Better equipment, upgrade materials, better armour, experience farming to improve your stats. The games have always encouraged testing new methods and trying out new weapons, improving your gear to assist in soaking up as much damage as possible. This balancing act then allows the player to experiment accordingly until they are comfortable with their playstyle, or until they are confident and skilled enough to block or dodge incoming attacks. Sekiro, on the other hand, is entirely skill-based in more ways than one. There are no base stats that can be easily improved, with the exception being your total health, posture and attack power. Improving your health and posture can only be done by locating prayer beads distributed about the world, most commonly found on mini-bosses. You need four of these in order to improve your vitality by one point, and the first opportunity you have to locate a fourth prayer bead, unless you are willing to troll the Headless Demon's cave in search of the early game path to Senpo Mountain, is after the first boss. <laughs> And with regards to attack power, the main way to increase this is to acquire memories provided to you after each main boss fight. There is another method as well, but it is fairly late game, and for the sake of spoilers, I won't say any more on this. To begin with, I was very critical of the fact that attack power was gated behind bosses, but thinking on it now, we can understand the motivation of this. Your first attack power increase can only be acquired by defeating the first real boss, Gyobu. He seemed insurmountable at first, because I was still trying to play this like a Souls game. I suspect that many individuals are having the same problem, and it doesn't take much searching through the Sekiro subreddit to see people discussing how much better they got at the game once they stopped trying to play it like a Souls game. The memory that you acquire for beating Gyobu is your first reward for having mastered the basics of the game's combat, for not trying to block everything or dodge everything, but rather learning how to parry, paying attention to the enemy's posture bars, 
and for listening to the hints that the NPCs offer you in the run-up to this place. Hell, I didn't click for quite some time. That firecrackers would be an excellent tool to use against the boss until my final successful attempt when I reread the description of the tool in question. FromSoft are infamous for not holding your hand and not offering much in the way of tutorials other than the basics. They like to give you simple tasks to begin with, then escalate it to a larger, more intimidating foe to test your new skills and ensure you're ready for the rest of the game. In the Souls games though, even if you haven't quite mastered the game's mechanics or are truly struggling, you can usually get by through expedient use of healing items, especially in Demon Souls and Dark Souls 2, or by kiting all of the enemies and waiting for the right moment to strike. Hell, arguably the largest difficulty spike in the entire original game, the Ornstein and Smell fight, can be easily surmounted through smart use of the pillars and a little bit of dirty pyromancy. Sekiro, by contrast, feels like the ultimate culmination of the mechanics From have been refining over the last decade or so. It is considerably more forthcoming with its methods, but it rather needs to be, considering that the only way to beat the game is to at least try to learn and improve. Once out of the tutorial area, the game offers an undying NPC for you to test your skills against. Starting out slow with basic attacks and ramping up the difficulty until the fight with him feels like a true mini-boss, incorporating all that you've learned so far and lending you plenty of opportunities to practice alternative methods of coping with various unblockable attacks. The only real downside to this is the fact that since this is one NPC, the timings for his attacks aren't going to be homogenous across the rest of the enemies you still need to go out into the world and figure those out for yourself. You cannot get by in this game just by hanging back and waiting out attacks because you will be punished. Many of the game's enemies and bosses will punish defensive manoeuvres, encouraging you to be more proactive in your approach. You will die, and you will keep dying until you get it right, or at least get better. Despite the lack of base stats and the lack of hand-holding, the game still offers plenty of leeway in other forms, the most striking of which is the world's verticality. Since jumping was something fairly limited in prior FromSoft adventures, verticality was almost always limited to sweeping vistas and grandiose buildings. You can admire the overblown spires and tremendous arched rooftops, but you can't go anywhere near them. In Sekiro, however, the verticality of levels is integral to the player experience, utilising rooftops to escape danger and avoid detection, you can make liberal use of your grappling hook to swing in and out of combat, confusing your enemies and giving you a few seconds to breathe before you rush back into the fray. In its blandest moments, verticality gives you the ability to string together numerous stealth kills, which is particularly useful when it comes to defeating mini-bosses. In its best moments, you can sling yourself from rooftop to rooftop, avoiding unnecessary fights, sending your enemies on red herring hunts, and perching yourself in advantageous positions to see who or what is where commit enemy positions and pathways to memory, and choose the best route forward. Since the game is considerably less linear than previous FromSoft games, there are multiple areas that you can visit, scope out and complete well before you even fight the second or third main bosses, giving you ample opportunity to test your skills in a new environment. So if you're not doing too well in one area, swing on out of there and go somewhere else. Aside from this, you do also have the Shinobi prosthetics, and as previously mentioned with Gyobu, these can absolutely help uncertain or less confident players defeat more intimidating foes with greater ease. Firecrackers will stun a huge majority of enemies, including most bosses and a good number of mini-bosses. The Umbrella prosthetic has an upgrade that completely negates terror-imbued attacks. Shuriken are extremely effective against airborne enemies and are very useful if you're struggling with the Lady Butterfly fight. To add to this, you also have shinobi skills, many of which are fairly upfront about how incredibly useful they are. It's flagrantly incorrect to state that Sekiro does not give the player any aid. It gives plenty, and there is ample opportunity to try new things to learn and to improve, but you don't need to be perfect to win, you just need to stay calm. And if you're really struggling, there's an entire excellent community out there with their own tales of success who are more than happy to impart their wisdom, hints and tips. You'd be surprised how much you can learn from a single YouTube comment. So, to loop this back around to trial and error gameplay, and in particular an especially inflammatory article that I won't give any credence to, the answer is yes. Sekiro is a game chock full of trial and error. But is it the same as dying over and over to complete a puzzle, like in Limbo or Inside, or running around in circles for 20 minutes trying to find the one specific route out of the area in Outlast 2? No. 
Not even remotely. Where trial and error crosses the threshold into surmountable difficulty is the wall that Sekiro sits upon. You can complain about how hard the game is and how it would be much easier if enemies were a little slower, or you can take one of the game's numerous training wheels and borrow it for a little while, until that moment when you suddenly realise you don't need it, and likely haven't for a long time. When you stop thinking of Sekiro as difficult and start thinking of it as challenging, you start to realise that its challenge is not in how much damage enemies do or how fast they are, but in how you approach a situation, how you use your skills and how you learn from your mistakes. And that mindset is extremely important. No matter how much you think about it, a difficult logic puzzle in an adventure game cannot be surmounted by hitting it really hard with a stick. If something doesn't make sense no matter how much you stare at it, it will never make sense regardless of how you spin it. I don't have footage of this because Lord knows I have no desire to replay this game, but this entire conversation around Sakura's difficulty reminds me of a particular fight in the Wii exclusive game Red Steel. Does anyone actually remember this game? It was massively anticipated and hyped up for the way that it was proclaiming to utilise the Wii's motion controls, and for the most part it was... adequate. It was... It was fine, I guess. The point is that the game encouraged you to learn and perfect its mechanics with varying degrees of success until it finally brought you face to face with a boss who, if you did not perfect the sword play, would kill you with one poison sword strike. I recall this boss taking a really long time, not least during parts of the Wii's less than stellar motion controls. But when I finally finished the fight perfectly, I was equal parts relieved and excited. I'd finally done it, I had finally overcome the hurdles the game had thrown at me, and proven myself to it. And that's somewhat how it felt to reach that click with Sekiro, to stop treating it like a Souls game and instead treat it as its own independent entity. So whilst the challenge of Sekiro can feel obnoxious at times, and whilst it can certainly feel impossible, it's worth considering the golden rule of antagonising games. If you're getting frustrated and making mistakes, put the game down and do something else for a while. Come back to it later. Look for new areas, new paths, new skills. Ask the community. Explore your options. We have spent many years bemoaning how much easier games have gotten over the last decade. I'm certainly guilty of that. Sekiro's challenge lies not in its core combat or in any fault of its tight, smart controls, but in its lack of compassion for its player. It doesn't care if you're frustrated, it cares if you survive. It's tough to get used to and tougher to perfect, but there's a little more rewarding than finally defeating that one boss you've been banging your head against for hours. Making it an excellent adventure in understanding, mediating, and overcoming difficulty.